Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I am Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Carl and Trent, um, who both work for the Ethereum Foundation and coordinate the ceremony for a trusted setup that is needed for EIP 4844, that's protodank sharding. Before I talk with uh, Carl and Trent about the KZG commit ceremony, let me tell you about our sponsor this week. Our sponsor is Omni. It is your new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet. Omni supports more than 25 protocols um, and you can manage all of your assets in one place across all major EVMs, Layer 2s, ZK Sync and Starknet coming soon and non-EVMs. But what's really special about Omni is that you can do all the most important things in Web3 directly within the wallet itself. Want to get yield? Omni allows you to get the best APYs with zero fees in three taps, be it staking, li liquid staking, lending, lending via Aave, or yield vaults via Yearn. Need to exchange USDC on ETH to Atom on Cosmos? Omni aggregates all major bridges and DEXs so you can bridge and swap across all supported networks in one transaction directly in your wallet. Love NFTs? Omni offers the broadest NFT support of any wallet, so you can collect and manage your favorite NFTs across all chains, all in one place. Omni truly is the easiest way to use Web3, and most importantly, Omni is fully self-custodial, meaning you never have to trust anyone with your assets other than yourself. And if you want, you can even use Omni's ledger integration, so all of your funds stay on your hardware wallet. Join ten, tens of thousands of users on this next generation wallet by downloading it today. Um, it's available on iOS or Android at omni.app. Carl and Trent, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So you both work at the Ethereum Foundation, um, but maybe let's talk about um, yourselves uh, first, um, your backgrounds and um, how you ended up at the foundation. So my background is actually originally in architecture and design, which is very different from crypto and, and this entire ecosystem. Um, uh, that's what I went to school for and did that for a few years and then found Ethereum in 2016 and started getting deeper and deeper into the ecosystem, uh, engaging with core development, uh, mostly just adjacent to it, really obsessed with it. Um, worked at a couple different companies and then ended up at the Ethereum Foundation doing coordination work, um, having having a ton of fun while doing it. I, I initially was was studying um, and a friend of mine told me how he was making crazy amounts of money out of this whole crypto thing, which piqued my interest. Um, and uh, so I also started looking into it. And uh, uh, the more I looked into it, the more excited I got about the like actual tech and seeing what's, what's happening under the hood. And uh, so my role sort of well, my interest very quickly changed from from that side of things into the actually like wanting to know what's happening and getting more involved. Um, and uh, then at the time, uh, staking on Ethereum was going to be 1500 ETH, which I did not personally have. So I came up with a whole complicated mechanism for like splitting it up and staking with friends and whatever. Um, and it turns out I was solving many of the same problems that need to be solved at the consensus level. So, uh, the, so I ended up uh, transitioning from uh, doing that and working on my own little project to doing the same thing, but uh, uh, for uh, Ethereum proof of stake and uh, being a researcher working on the protocol ever since. Super nice. And you brought it down to 32 ETH. So uh, uh, <laughs> seems to have worked. We still have solutions to do it together with friends, right? So basically it's like, uh, uh, yeah. Fantastic. So what you're currently working on is um, you are working behind the scenes to make dank sharding happen. So more specifically, proto dank sharding, also known as shard blob transactions as per EIP 4844. Um, we had the eponymous dank rat on the show a while ago, I think it must have been about two years ago, um, to talk about the Ethereum scaling roadmap. Um, but let's recapitulate you know, all of the various flavors of uh, sharding, please. So basically, what's sharding, what's dank sharding, what's proto-dank sharding, and where are we at? The, the, the word sharding comes, I believe, from the database side of things. Uh, but the idea is um, splitting up something that's too big to be handled on one uh, machine across many. And so in the early Ethereum ro roadmap, sharding was this idea of having uh, taking the 
the, the, the work that had to be done uh, and, and the amount of data that had to be processed on, uh, on Ethereum and splitting up amongst multiple, in this case, it was chains. So we'd have multiple concurrent chains running uh, next to each other. Um, and together they would tell you the, um, the sum of what's happening on Ethereum. But we quickly realized that this has a lot of problems um, where the data becomes sort of siloed in these uh, various shard chains and making sure the consensus works amongst all the shard chains and transferring the data. Uh, and there's lots of concerns about um, interoperability between them, uh, long times to finality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so while it was a technical solution that was going to solve a lot of problems for Ethereum scaling, it was one that was quite ugly in terms of uh, breaking up the fungibility of Ethereum um, into multiple pieces uh, to what we're calling at the time quote unquote shard chains. Um, subsequent to that, the idea of dunk sharding came about, uh, as you mentioned, named after dunk rod. The idea here being that instead of uh, having multiple chains run running simultaneously, we have one chain with like crazy amounts of data avail available to it. But to make processing this feasible for um, home stakers and reasonably sized uh, machines, uh, we, can, we can split up the data that everyone's responsible for. So it's not separate chains, it's one chain, but you're, you're not responsible for everything on this one chain, you're only responsible for a small amount as a validator. Um, and this greatly opened up the, the, the design paradigm um, and also helped a lot with rollups who were trying to figure out mechanisms for speaking between these shard chains um, that would be um, transparent to the user but uh, um, weren't at the time. So now by, by having this one large amount of data that everyone has access to, um, it's no longer something that each individual um, uh, rollup would have to worry about. It's now this massive blob which everyone can see. From the transition from sharding to uh, dank sharding, we kind of lost the compute on the shards, right? So basically the shards now exclusively store data. Yeah. Um, but this is also this is uh, a bit of a, a design philosophy change which we've had over the years as well, which is changing from this idea of having uh, one monolithic structure um, to separating out the roles, the the, the, the important components uh, for consensus here. So initially we had um, the the, the part, part of the role of validating was going to be uh, watching for all sorts of different types of computation. There were going to be different ways of computing. But Rollup simplified this by saying someone else does all the computation and um, then uh, you don't need to worry about that. And then on the other, on the other side, sharding is going to handle the data. So a simple way of thinking about this, the, 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 the proto-dank sharding vision of scaling Ethereum or the dank sharding uh, vision of scaling Ethereum rather is to um, the, the, the compute, the scaling compute needs. Those are handled by Rollups. And the data that these rollups are going to need, this is handled by uh, proto dank sharding. Mm -hmm. So, w w what's the difference between dank sharding and proto dank sharding now? Um, well, as usual, uh, it's it, it comes down to a bit of evolution here. So, uh, dank sharding initially is this very complicated proposal, uh, which is going to be in essence, very hard to, 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 to implement. The, the full dank sharding requires um, a lot of complicated things to happen at the networking level, uh, plus more cryptographic things, um, basically because we require validators to, to, to look off the extra roles, which are um, checking that this data really is available with uh, uh, cryptographic techniques. There was, there's, there's sampling involved, um, all sorts of things like this. But looking at this, this would ultimately take years and years to implement. So in the interest of having a scaling solution for Ethereum now, we have proto-dank sharding, which is a simplified version. So it strips out some of the extra nice-to-haves and limits the amount of data we can scale to, but still provides like dramatic increases in the amount of data that, that is available to rollups and is something we can ship in the short term um, to, 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 to alleviate uh, data constraints right now. And we're doing it in a way that's upgradable. So we can move on to full dank sharding in the future um, uh, incorporating what we've we've done already. This is the basis. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that's being addressed by dank sharding is also the size bloat. Um, so this is somewhat counterintuitive because we just learned that um, basically there'll be massive blobs of data that will be um, 
on the network somehow. Um, so, but they're only being kept around for a limited amount of time, right? Yeah, that's the idea. Um, I think everyone knows that uh, uh, state is one of the hardest things about running a Ethereum validator. It requires a lot of space. And so uh, this was a limitation to how much we could scale. So the idea behind uh, uh, dank sharding is to make someone else responsible. It's no longer the validator's role to store this data uh, in perpetuity. So each, uh, the va as a validator, you, uh, you get assigned some data to look after. Uh, you must download it and uh, uh, you make it available for everyone else. And then the various uh, L2s are going to go look at this data, download the portions that they need, and then after two weeks or so, this data gets thrown away by the validators. So you have a rolling window of two weeks um, for what's yeah. available. And would there be like archi archival nodes who kind of, you know, store all the blob data? Uh, yes. Um, it now becomes like a super uber archival node. It's like another level of, of archiving if this is something you care about. Um, but the the the... the, the important thing here is that individual validators don't don't worry about it because the the current way we handle state in ethereum is a bit ridiculous you pay a one time fee to add some to 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 add some storage and then the blockchain promises to keep it around for forever which is a little bit insane and if we add so much scaling this just gets more and more insane so we now shift the responsibility onto the people who actually care about the data so um, L2 sequences are going to worry about this and and they'll obviously want to know the state of everything so they're going to uh, run that they're, they're going to store the data they care about locally that's relevant to to to, to a given rollup and you as a user for example may wish to also uh, if you're keeping your stuff on l2s also download that data for yourself which contains your own transactions if you don't trust your sequencer uh, but it's just shifting the responsibility onto who's who, who actually cares about the data okay and is there any sort of gatekeeping for who can actually transmit data to the dank shard so basically if i if I deploy a new L2, can I just can I just send all my data there, or is this is this um, is this something that needs to be approved? Uh, no, there's uh, it's it's all very open um, as per normal Ethereum things. We 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 try handle this via economic uh, uh, systems. So you can submit a uh, transaction. There's a new transaction type, um, and this transaction type basically refers to data that comes along in a blob um, and the blob's not a part of the block it's on, in what we call a sidecar it's just like external thing adjacent to the block and you can say like hey um, I like I here's my transaction and I'm referring to some data here that you can find uh, on the on, in the sidecar and then validators when they're validating a block go look for this data on the side but no no one's regulating that and it's actually something where it's gonna be a bit funny when we when we when 4844 launches is that there currently isn't enough usage in L2s to even fill up all the space. So there's basically going to be free uh, temporary storage in these in these blobs. So I expect all sorts of creative things to, to, to start happening again and going back to the old days of people trying to store like full images and that kind of thing in these in these blobs because it's going to be so cheap and there's no constraints to whatever's uh, to what gets put in there. Cool. How did you guys um, come up with um, the two weeks window? So is this, why is this the sweet spot in terms of trade-off between storing unnecessary data for too long and keeping data around for just long enough? Ah, so that, that's actually an interesting one. Um, and that's that I'm actually sure it's two weeks. Uh, <laughs> the, I've, I've, uh, because I've been focusing so much on the ceremony stuff we'll get to in a moment, um, I've, I've, I've lost track of exactly what the latest constants are. Um, but... The, 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 the trade-off here is basically between uh, having it being a practical uh, length of time to have everyone be able to look for the data, check it's available, download it if they care about it, um, and having it not be too long that we blow up the storage uh, for validators to, to, to keep. But exactly what that constant is right now, <laughs> um, I'm not, not, not exactly sure. Yeah, I think it's still under discussion, but it's, a, it's roughly around there. Cool. So you guys work on the KZG ceremony. Um, before we talk about the ceremony itself, what is KZG? So the, um, the dunk sharding requires a, 
commitment scheme, a way of saying like, the, the, because the blocks themselves that we see on the Ethereum blockchain, the validators look into don't actually have the full data. Um, that data is available in this, this blob sidecar. Uh, we need a way of referring to that data. So the standard way we do this in blockchains right now um, is just hashes. So uh, Ethereum uses uh, Kitchuk slash SHA-3 for all its hashing um, to point to the data. But this doesn't meet our needs and requirements uh, for for um, for this the solution. So the reason that's not true is that inside of a rollup, for example, we, your rollup needs to be able to point to uh, the data. So um, in the in in a block, the a normal Ethereum block, it would only have a reference to the data, and you need a when when you're referring to it, you need to provide the full data um, that you care about alongside alongside that transaction. If you're trying to do a fraud proof, for example. Um, but we run into problems here where the uh, uh, standard hashes um, like 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 SHA three or Ketchak are very expensive to to do computations around um, in zk rollups, for example. So it would make things virtually impossible for for zk rollups. Um, so we need to look to to other means, um, and this also has some really nice. Um, um, so really nice additional features uh, which you can make use of uh, because there's a second thing we're doing which is to when you can when there's a blob of data um, we take this data and we extend the amount of data data that's available we, we, we double this the, the, the length of this data so after after we have the the, the, the transactions that are in this this blob uh, we extend this uh, the size of this blob and we put a polynomial through it and this polynomial allows us basically to do um, uh, error encoding on this, this data. So we can recover some of it later if, say, 10% is lost. And by doing this, uh, the, the, the system, um, the, the hashes would be a like, very inconvenient system because hashes aren't an algebraic structure. Um, so the, when, when we do this extending, it would have to be a separate mechanism and it would have to have separate proofs about how this mechanism is working. Whereas when we fit this polynomial, um, KZG is a system which uh, lever uh, leverages some of the arithmetic that's available inside of um, uh, elliptic curves. And this just happens to be the same math we use for extending these polynomials. So there's this like synergy of the, the, the commitments coming for free um, and, 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 and linking back there. The short, the short version of the response is KZG stands for, it comes from the names of the authors for this specific commitment. Uh, Kate, or is it Kate? Zevericha and Goldberg. It's Kate, Kate, yeah. There we go. But yeah, that's, that's, that's my contribution there. But Carl got the, the, the technical bit out of the way. <laughs> so basically, to kind of to, to um, paraphrase this, um, basically, there's different ways of um, compressing data um, that we've used before, and they don't need a trusted setup, but for various reasons, they're unsuitable for this job. So basically, we have um, we have decided to move to a different one, which as a uh, drawback has the trusted setup, right? That's that's a pretty accurate summary. <laughs> cool. So um, let's talk about how the, so you said um, the KZG commitment kind of um, compresses the data. Basically, it's, it kind of runs it through a poly polynomial. So I assume there's a limit to how much you can compress with one, with one transaction. So, so I think uh, compressors here is not quite the right word. Um, or unless it's, you want to interpret it as a very lossy compression. Yeah, it's a very lossy compression. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, it really, it really is a commitment scheme here. Um, but the 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 we do have limits on how large this polynomial can be, um, and that's actually like a fundamental limit on um, like how, how large you set this this polynomial to be affects how much data we can commit to. Um, which affects like how big this trusted setup that we're going to run needs to be. It's like this, this, this long compounding thing. So it's like a very important parameter. So how, how have you set this parameter? So the, 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 the answer is 
sort of we have and sort of we haven't, but I'll get into that in a sec. Um, so the, the, um, but the idea is basically taking what the limits are to, to nodes in terms of networking and storage currently uh, to validators and nodes um, and to use this as sort of a, um, uh, an upper bound on, on, on where we can, we can set um, the, 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 the amount of data requirements and to sort of work backwards from there. Um, of course, we don't know how to do this without... Uh, well, I mean, we don't know. There's no data collection. So there have been some experiments run um, to, to try to understand where all of this is. But the, the, the long and short of it is uh, we've settled on this number of 4,096 um, of these points. Um, and that will be then the, 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 the maximum, side of a, maximum size of a single blob. Um, but because we haven't fully decided, like, that, that's what you decided now. And those are the numbers that will be in 4844. But in the future, we don't actually know what it could be, uh, particularly with full uh, dunk sharding down the line. And so we, this, the ceremony we're running is actually four sub ceremonies. Um, it, it's, it's opaque to you as a participant, but they're actually like four little ceremonies inside where you calculate it with several lengths of this polynomial. So 4,096, uh, 92, uh, anyways, double that, all the powers of two, um, up to basically two to the 16 uh, total points. Um, the idea being by having multiple ceremonies, we have, uh, we, we, we can change this, um, as Ethereum's needs scale down the line. And as we have faster internet connections, um, and, and more, more cheap uh, storage for validators. So you can, you can accommodate up to three orders of magnitude larger than what we currently de what we are going to deploy, you know, as a first instance. Yes. Yes. Ah, so super cool. Trusted setups. It's, it's, uh. It's a fascinating topic, isn't it? So basically, the first time I I, I kind of came across this was um, Morgan Peck's telling of the Zcash ceremony, which I linked to in the show notes just because it is so entertaining. Um, so basically, people met up in this rundown motel and they kind of they they kind of disconnected everyone uh, everything and then they kind of used brand new uh, cash board hardware and destroyed it afterwards and it it's it, it's um uh when you listen to it um it sounds crazy but at the same time it also sounds very rational <laughs> um so since then um it's been a while. So what has happened in Trusted Setup since? Uh, there's been quite a few. Obviously, Zcash was pioneering, and that's part of why their ceremony was so exciting. And so I, I, I've listened to the same story last year when I was you know, doing my research and getting caught up on this stuff. And it was really... I don't feel like they dramatized much. It was a really incredible story. Um, and that's what a lot of people think of when they when they hear trusted setups or, you know, setup ceremonies. Um, but there's been many, many setups, especially, in, I mean, in crypto is what we're focused on. Um, and I think most of them have been powers of Tau of varying sizes. Uh, Filecoin did a pretty large one. Um, Celo did one. A uh, couple different organizations within Ethereum have done trusted setups um, for a number of different things. Um, so there, there've been quite a few, um, Carl, you can jump in if I'm forgetting any, um, but th I think one thing that's been consistent over time is that people are more and more comfortable understanding there's, there's greater education as more and more of these ceremonies take place and people understand the mechanics and why they're important and, and how they operate. And, um, I think Seacash also, because they were so early, they, they didn't have the benefit of what we have now of, is just like, like I said, the awareness, the education and the mechanics for doing these sorts of things. I don't know the specific technical bits, but Zcash had, a, had to do quite a few things manually um, given they were doing uh, they were doing a lot of this for the first time. Uh, but we're fortunate to be a couple years down the road and we can build on a lot of what they've done in the past. Yeah, I mean, basically, you if you can at all help it, you never want to do a trusted setup. Um, trusted setups add uh, attack surface and complexity. Um, in the 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 Zcash uh, uh, 
instance, there were um, concerns about whether it had gone correctly the first time uh, due, to, due to all sorts of fun and interesting things. Um, and then we learned later down the line that even the more the, 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 that even so, there was a bug in the the the, 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 the Zcash setup, um, which which they had to address um, in 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 some interesting ways. And they have this turnstile and this 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 whole upgrade process um, to, to to handle this. Um, and so you ultimately want to avoid it. What I think is uh, what's what's different here is the. Uh, from, from that, and the reason we're less concerned about that is the complexity of the setup. Um, there, the computations and the amount of data you had to handle were gigabytes large. You had to keep the secret around for a while. There's the, the trust. The setup is about establishing a secret, and there was a secret that everyone had to keep around for a while uh, while they're doing these computations. Um, and ultimately, it, it only scaled to I believe six people in the in their first in their first setup, um, which means that it was a very small and very trust us kind of thing. Um, and the, over time, we've seen this transition to a simplifying what's needed out of trusted setups, um, so that you don't need to depend on a small group of people, and just scaling out to uh, make, make make this easier to contribute, um, so that the trust the trust base is a much larger group of people. So now it's twenty twenty three. When you design a ceremony uh, these days, um, what kind of parameters? Um, can you tweak, or basically, what 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 are the design decisions that go into the ceremony? So I, I can give a higher level overview, but we're fortunate um, in that we were we, we have the ability to use parameters which are pretty low requirements. Um, like Carl mentioned, for the Zcash ceremony, it was gigabytes for Filecoin ceremony. I know it was it was tens or maybe even hundred uh, gigabytes. These are you know not trivial to pass around, especially between different countries. If it's going to somewhere with uh, some sort of national firewall, um, it's really hard to pass around that amount of data. We're fortunate to uh, have a very, very small ceremony and sort of everything follows from, from the very lightweight requirements. We don't have a ton of data that needs to be passed around. The computation is pretty light. Um, It can be browser based. You know, we're, we're, lucky in a sense that we can work from such very light requirements. Um, yeah. But basically what became lighter? So I, I, I myself took part in the Aztec ignition ceremony um, and you had to download a Docker image and run it and basically check the uh, check the checksum and kind of make sure you're running the right thing. And then it took it still took like 10 hours to run on a top of the line MacBook. Um, so what's become easier? So, I mean, it's not, it's not that ceremonies have become easier to run. It's that our particular use or what we, what we need out of it is very simple. Um, so we need the, the, the most basic thing, which is, uh, which mo- most these ceremonies generate sometimes, uh, called a phase one. Um, and that's powers of tau. So as I mentioned earlier, this uh, commitment thing relies on polynomials. And, uh, if you think of a polynomial, there's some, term x and you have x squared, x cubed, whatever, uh, up to higher powers. These are the, the, the powers of tau that we'll be referring to later. There's some secret and we need to know the secret, the secret squared, cubed, etc. Um, and fundamentally, we just require very few um, points here. We only require, as mentioned earlier, 4,096 points for the, the, the base 4844 setup, which is really nice uh, from a complexity standpoint. So that's, that's really helped scale things down as that file is now tiny. And then the second thing is that because we only need these powers, that we don't need further computation, um, and uh, there's um, some some additional principles that basically come in because the requirements of of KCG are lower than that of some of these these other zk um, setups, that it just allows us to have this this very basic uh, uh, computation. There's like for example in in lots of trusted setups, you do the trusted setups, and then you prove with a zero knowledge proof that all the computation you did was correct, uh, which adds many orders of magnitude of complexity on top of what can already be a lot of compute to do. Um, where in this case, it's so simple that we don't even need to do a zero knowledge proof. Or I mean, you could view it as a bespoke zero knowledge proof, uh, but you basically need to verify um, a few pairings um, to, to check that this is all correct. I took part in the test ceremony earlier this morning to kind of just to see what it's like. And I can confirm that it is 
really easy. You kind of, you type in like a couple of characters, you move your mouse a bit, you kind of sign an Ethereum message um, and you're done. Um, it literally takes 30 seconds. Um, so what, how many people are you aiming to have participate in this ceremony? Uh, we'd like to have at least 10,000. I think Carl's goal is something related to the, the powers or you can be more specific there. But yeah, we, we want it to be the we're hopeful that it'll be the largest set up ceremony of this kind. <clears throat> Again, it's not anything special that we're doing. We're just very fortunate to have very low requirements in terms of compute and bandwidth. Um, and uh, yeah, we're so we're, we're hoping that it will be the largest ceremony of this kind, 10,000 is sort of our happy case, and maybe it'll be even more. Uh, we'll see, we've got two months to to fill that up. But yeah, Carl, what was it related to um, number of powers or something you wanna be higher than? I, I have the silly, the silly notion where I would like there to be more people who've participated than the total number of powers in the ceremony, like the, the, the number of points we need to calculate. Um, this is not for any particularly meaningful, uh, <laughs> it doesn't have a cryptographic benefit or whatever. It's just, it's it's such a ridiculous idea to me that we have uh, this whole trusted setup that uh, there's all this computation for. And in the end, like it's the, the, the file that just refers to the people who've contributed is going to be bigger than the like actual output of the ceremony. Like there's more, like <laughs> the list of people who've, 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 who've joined are longer than the, the output we care about. It's purely a vanity metric. <laughs> Absolutely. But there, there is a reason that's important, right? Is that um, the, the, the reason that, that this name, that the name Trusted Setup exists is that you need to trust that this was done correctly and that um, the this, this secret hasn't been stored because uh, if the secret has been kept around, then you can do things like breaking the ceremony. Um, you can, in a, a ZK setup, you can often prove um, things that aren't true. And in our case, you could commit and reveal to data that uh, that wasn't initially agreed upon. So you could change the data that the rollups see. So that's really bad. And what you need to trust is that this ceremony went correctly. And the, the way these trust assumptions look is that you need at least one person to have honestly done their job. And honestly here means you need to have uh, generated some, some randomness, uh, done this comp the, the, the computation, and then thrown away the randomness without storing it or without publicizing it. Um, and so in the initial, like in, Z, in the Zcash setup there, if you only have six people, then this is really hard to, uh, to, to convince others if you have such a limited set. So by having more and more people, it's like, you don't need to trust one person or some, some limited number of people. We have thousands and thousands of people and you just need to like, hopefully have one of them that you can trust or maybe a few of them where maybe you don't trust any individual, but you trust them all of, all of them a little bit kind of, kind of idea. And this is where we build up the security assumption, which is why we care so much about having many people participate. So short of everyone colluding at once uh, and kind of storing the secrets and kind of revealing the, you know, the, the mega secret, um, what needs to go wrong for it to break? So, I, well, I can, t I can talk a little bit about like the bigger picture stuff. Um, so like Carl said, we want as many people as possible participating in this. Um, because these things are, because they only require a single honest participant, once you're past that point, like if you've contributed and you're like, okay, I'm one of 10 people, I know for sure that I didn't, uh, I'm not behaving maliciously. Um, once it gets to one out of 100 or one out of 1,000, it, um, it becomes degrees of, you're improving the credibility of the ceremony in degrees. So... There's no like threshold you need to reach. It's just more is better. So the more the merrier. Um, really at the end of the day, these are uh, like many things in blockchain, these setup ceremonies are um, coordinated. They're, they're public rituals about building consensus. Um, and that means it's consensus around the how the ceremony was operated, whether it was openly accessible, um, whether the output of the ceremony seems credible, um, all of these things go into making a successful ceremony. Like I said, after that, after you get, uh, your participation included or, you know, a reasonable number of people, the, the security assumptions, there's no like binary 
threshold we need to cross over. Um, it's about convincing both the people who participated in the ceremony and then the future uh, users or um, protocols that will leverage the KZG commitments in the future. So it's not that we're just convincing, you know, the single person who participated, but it's also, uh, you know, 10, 20 years, whenever we do another setup, if we do another one in the future, that block of time has to have significant and sufficient credibility to all of these people participating that the ceremony was conducted openly, um, people could participate how they saw fit, and um, it really is about uh, convincing everybody together that, okay, are we, do we agree that this was, this was good enough? Okay, we'll use the output of the ceremony. Yeah, and that's, that's where the, the reference to trust comes in, maybe a little bit different than the original, original conception, um, because a lot of people hear Trusted Setup and they think of, you know, this, this romantic cyberpunk Zcash story, which is amazing, um, but it really was a Trusted Setup in that case. We're trying to, and like I've touched on before, we're, we're fortunate to have a small setup where we don't have to rely on such a small group of individuals. But the trusted setup is a bit of a misnomer in this sense that we don't have to trust anybody because it's it's very, very accessible. You know, it takes, like you said, 30 seconds in the browser. Um, you don't have to even download software if you don't want to. Um, obviously, there will be many different avenues to do this, but um, it is a there is a bit of an education uh, deficit that we have to help people catch up with in that, you know, this isn't six people in a hotel room. This is tens of thousands of people around the world uh, who can do the computation in under a minute in their browser. Um, so they're obviously in the same family in terms of setups, but they they do have significant departures from uh how they actually get implemented. So uh, for, for us, we've been using summoning ceremony uh, because we're, you know, summoning this, this random output, this random number. Um, trusted setup is still what a lot of people know. That they, that's the term they're familiar with. But yeah, we've, we've definitely leaned on summoning ceremony to communicate how this is, you know, broad participation with the intent of producing this public ritual in the form of a ceremony that goes for a few months. Cool. So um, there is one entity called the sequencer that kind of um, that kind of moves, you know, uh, from one uh, that that kind of moves from participant to participant in a way. Uh, so they kind of see the contribution and they the or the the sequencer sees the contribution and verifies that it's still a correct state. Um, that does give them an unrivaled inside view, you know, at the state um, after every uh, commitment. Is that somehow exploitable? No. Um, the, 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 the sequencer's role, um, like its name kind of suggests, is literally just to decide who's next. So um, if we have so many people trying to contribute and everyone's like, Try, try, tries to participate. How do we decide that it's Alice instead of Bob whose whose turn it is now to to contribute? Because this is like a fundamentally um, sequential thing. It's not parallelizable. So um, the sequencer, uh, you ask the the sequencer like, hey, can I can I participate now? Um, and if the there's a free slot, the sequencer will be like, yeah, sure. Here's the file. Um, and then you go off on your own with the file the sequencer just sent you. You do a bunch of calculations. Um, it combines your randomness with the randomness of the people that came before you. And then you send your file back to the sequencer. And then the sequencer uh, checks that you didn't like try to delete someone else's secret or um, do other uh, funny, uh, funny things there. And if so, then we'll send your, um, uh, your file on to the next person. So the output that the sequencer has is um, they can basically see what the ceremony looked like after your contribution. But the funny thing is, is that this is what everyone sees. So there's, it's not like the sequencer has more access to more data that could be used to break it. Uh, all this data gets ultimately stored and uh, you can, uh, there's another, the, the, the sequencer will just give it to you for everyone's, like for the entire history of this, the ceremony. And part of it's required to verify that the ceremony ran correctly after the fact. So the sequencer doesn't have any more insight into this information. 
What the sequencer does have is a little bit more uh, control in deciding who goes next, uh, or they could, it could theoretically prevent someone from going next. So you could say like, hey, can I have a turn now? And they can be like, no, someone's busy. And they could just lie to you and prevent you from uh, participating. Or um, counter to that, uh, you could uh, do all your computation, you get the file, all's happy, you send it back to the sequencer when you're done, and the sequencer's like, oh, sorry, you made a mistake, and it just rejects your, um, your output. So that's sort of the additional power the sequencer has, uh, which sounds like th 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 this is not great. We don't like having single entities um, in, in, in uh, decentralized systems, which like have more power than others. Um, but in this case, it's a little, uh, it's a little different in that the, uh, if the sequencer does something like this, their fault is attributable. So if they say like, oh, your file wasn't correct, they'll send you the message saying your file wasn't correct back. And this message is signed by the sequencer. So you can then take this and say like, you can provide this to someone else and they'll be convinced that the sequencer was falsely rejecting your, your file. Um, or uh, if, if the sequencer is like saying that uh, it won't let you participate in the first place, um, then you can do something like um, use uh, the, 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 the way you prove who you are to the sequencers, you, you, you sign in with Ethereum. So using an Ethereum count to say like, hey, this is me. I am, in my case, carlbeak.eth. Um, the, maybe the sequencer tries to censor me, so I could just take another Ethereum account and try to do the same thing and, 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 and sign in there. Um, something that's not tied to my identity, such that the sequencer couldn't censor me. So if you're worried about these kinds of things, there like, are ways of getting around it. Um, in, and, and, and ultimately, if, if these are concerns that we see, then we want to stop the ceremony, investigate why this went wrong, and start the whole thing again if, if these are major concerns that we see. When people start complaining that, you know, they can't participate, um, I mean, obviously, they might be vocal about this and basically they raise uh, scrutiny. Yeah, so it, it, it depends what, what that, that looks like, right? If it's uh, some, some crazy person trying to shill their coin over Ethereum and thinks Ethereum needs to burn, then that's a whole other thing. But like, if it's someone who we can say is a reasonable claim to making this, this true, or we see it from a, a, few, a, a few trustworthy people, um, or they can, uh, particularly if they can provide these 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 uh, certificates, which prove the sequencers being being lying or cheating, then we really like need to investigate what's gone wrong here. Um, in in practice, the way we try to avoid all of this is that we are like we've 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 put the th sequencer through some extensive audits. Um, we we had the the ceremony itself audited uh, uh, once before, and then like the sequencer sequencer specifically audited um, to try like hopefully find that there are none of these. Uh, these edge cases, um, that could happen. Um, but ultimately, it's only going to be by actually running it that we find out that that this, it has gone the way we intended. Okay, so basically now the sequencer says, uh, Friedrich, it's your turn, um, and I do the maths. It's really difficult to talk about complex maths without uh, a blackboard or, you know, slides. Um, maybe let's, let's, can I give you um, a... Uh, a way of describing what I think I have to calculate, and you tell me whether that's correct. So basically, um, basically, I I generate randomness somehow in my browser uh, by kind of moving my mouse and uh, uh, entering some characters and and so on, uh, and it's a number, right? And then basically, I take that number to different powers and put it into an elliptic curve, and then basically the four thousand whatever. I mean, th th that's kind of the powers of tau that you were talking about earlier, right? So basically those 4,000 numbers, that's the thing that I pass back to the sequencer. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's pretty much correct. Um, the, the stage you described as putting it into an elliptic curve, what you're doing there is you're mixing it in with the people who previously participated. So the sequencer is going to give you 4,096 elliptic curve points. Uh, the first one represents like the uh, the secret to the power of zero, secret to the power of one, etc., etc., um, in in increasing powers, and then you you generate your own secret and calculate these, and then you just multiply them, and that's like that that's how you combine your secret with the other ones, and that's that's what your contribution looks like, plus an additional point which basically just proves that you did all this correctly, allows people to verify that um, you 
updated from the previous secret to your secret correctly. Super. Um, so I love how how Zen powers of of powers of Tao sounds. By the way, I think it's uh, very <laughs> it's nicely named. It's very cool. Um, but that that kind of leaves the question: How do I then destroy my randomness? Right? Because you guys rely on the fact that people afterwards get rid of their randomness. Because basically, if it's stored locally on like ten thousand computers, um, obviously that, that that's a nightmare. So there's a couple of different ways. Yes, of course, we we want people to not keep their randomness. Um, one way to safeguard against that happening is by having many, many participants, which we're unable to because it's a small ceremony size. But um, we do, yes, we want to prevent people from or strongly encourage them to not keep this around because that could uh, compromise the ceremony if, you know, somebody spins up some bots and, and tries to influence the credibility of the ceremony. So uh, there are three um, randomness components that go into this, which are combined. Two of them, which you mentioned, um, you're moving your mouse around and the browser is taking snapshots of where the mouse is at, at certain bits of time. Uh, you're also typing something into a little text field. Um, and we we suggest that the users include some some random characters and uh, we don't show this to people. So it's, it's masked like kind of how you would enter a password. So those are the two, two that the, the user inputs. Um, and then the final third one is uh, the browser generates randomness on its own locally. Uh, and then all three of these are combined and uh, that's, what, that's what's used as the entropy. That's what you do the computation over. Um, so if somebody were to record all three of these well first they'd have to they'd have to be digging into the browser and, and extract that randoms the other two um are maybe a little more cosmetic uh because the users are entering it themselves and we already have this browser randomness as a backup um but you know they they do add add a little bit of uh entropy themselves but at the end of the day it's backstopped by this browser randomness that you'd have to try pretty hard to to dig into and actually extract from the browser itself. How is it deleted afterwards though? Because in principle you could you could probably save it. You could. Um, and that's again where like that that's what we define as participating honestly is that you you don't try save it. But I think like uh, ultimately, your browser just like as soon as you've handed the file back to the sequencer, if you're participating via um, the, the 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 client at uh, ceremony.ethereum.org, um, if, if if you do that, when you hand back the file, the the browser will, will just delete it itself. So it's a little bit different to like I this 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 like we need one honest person, but it's like in order to do this, we need if we have ten thousand participants, we need ten thousand people to like open up their 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 uh, their browser, like take apart the code, figure out how to get the browser to like save the secret for them, uh, and then save that secret. Then they all need to get together and like publicize or communicate their secret with each other, such that uh, this the 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 the, the, ult the uber secret can be calculated. So it's like we require like a pretty decent amount of technical competence um, and malice on the part of literally every participant in order for, for this to be an issue. You at least need at least one honest or lazy or stupid person to participate. <laughs> Ho hopefully <Exactly>. all three. <laughs> the other yeah. thing, at wh which maybe we'll get into later, is we will be running a special contribution period um, where we'll have maybe more elaborate participation uh mechanisms and ways of generating and, and storing randomness. Um, maybe we can get into that, but there will be a verifiable or like more documentation as to how they generated and then destroyed their secret. Um, but that'll, that's a, a separate from the general contribution period. Okay. And the general contribution period, is it first come first serve or do I kind of have to book a slot? So yeah, typically with larger ceremonies, it, because there's this significant data that they have to pass around um, and you want to fit as many contributions as you can into a limited time period whether it's a month or two months um, yes you, you would have to slot you'd have you'd have to choose a slot sign up in advance they would 
uh, send you some sort of token, and then you would check into whatever hosted interface is um, passing you the latest version of the, the computed data. Um, we do not have slots. We have a general lobby, and then people are or accounts are picked at random from the lobby. Um, so it, it's it's a little bit nicer that you just show up. The trade-off is that you don't know exactly when you're going to get included. So the lobby could have thousands of participants, and we'll just tell you, maybe you should come back another time. Um, but the good thing is it'll go for at least two months. So hopefully, it, you know, if the lobby is full for two months with thousands of participants, that's both, the, you know, that's a good problem, I guess, because we're going to have, you know, I think we'll, we'll definitely get to uh, many, many tens of thousands, but um, some people may not be able to fit in. So maybe we'll get to that problem when we get there. Um, but it's just a lobby, Carl, if you probably have some more specifics on what the lobby actually is and how it's implemented. Yeah, so it's basically uh, you, you you check in with the sequencer first. You're like, hey, I'm Carl or Frederico, whatever. The sequencer is like, oh, welcome. And then you're like, oh, hey, can you give me the file? And the sequencer is like, nope, sorry, someone else is busy with it. And you're just like, everyone's just asking like, hey, is, like, what about now? Is the file ready? Um, and then as soon as someone's like, as soon as the file is available, the sequencer is like, oh, yeah, sure, here you go. So it has this like random element uh, where it's just like, if, if, if you keep asking the sequencer like, hey, can I have the file now? Um, eventually the file will be free and you'll, uh, you'll get allocated. So the, this is quite different in terms of you don't have uh, time slots you have to meet. Um, it's also like one of the, the, the things is if there are time slots or it does take like, if, if you have a queuing mechanism, that queue is six hours or 10 hours, like is your computer still gonna be on then? Or like all sorts of additional questions where here we can sort of avoid all of those because if you're asking like your computer's asking, hey, can I have the file now? Um, and that, that means your computer is online and ready to do these computations. So it like works really well from both a like simplifying things standpoint and from just like allowing many, many people to, to contribute. Mm -hmm. What about the special contingent that you just alluded to, Trent? The special contribution period, yeah. So given we, we only need to trust one person, this is, um, or we only need a single honest participant, this is one way that we can take the, uh, the sort of theatrics and the public perception of the ceremony to another level. Um, so we're running, we're running a grants round, which will support people who want to either write their own implementation, but as you mentioned, uh, do some sort of unique or special contribution. Um, one of the famous ones is, I, I believe it was for the first Zcash ceremony, they took a, an artifact, like a piece of cloth from Chernobyl, they took it up into an airplane and um, used a Geiger counter to measure the radiation that was coming off of it, recorded that, and because they were in an airplane, you know, it's, I don't know how you would uh, compromise the, the data they're recording while they're in the airplane, 3,000 feet in the air. Um, but this is sort of the elaborate, um, fun data contribution that we would like to see in the future. Maybe not, obviously not everybody in an airplane. Everybody is not going to be able to get uh, radioactive material from Chernobyl. But this special contribution period will happen after uh, the, the first two months, we'll take a bit of a break, turn off the, the hosted interface and have people who, you know, um, they want to use some sort of special event that they planned with their local Ethereum community or someone who is, uh, they have a specific niche interest outside of crypto that they can somehow incorporate. Um, these are the kinds of things we're looking for. And uh, the, so, yeah, applications for this are now open and we're, we're giving grants for people who have interesting ways of generating uh, entropy and then storing it. And like I mentioned earlier, this is also part of um, this, this part of the project is recording it and or documenting it, not recording the secret, but documenting the entire process of, okay, here's, here are the steps I went through to generate the randomness. Um, here's the way I discarded it. And here's the way, you know, it destroyed the computer or something. But the the average member will just contribute through an interface. They won't have, you know, it'll just be in the browser, but we'll have these very elaborate, um, fun contributions that we can then see, you know, we have a documentation for actually how they planned it, how they set it up, how they generated and recorded and discarded the, the secret. 
Super cool. I look forward to kind of seeing what kind of entertaining things people come up with. One last thing about KZG commitments. They are quantum vulnerable, right? So if I had a quantum computer, I could break it. Yeah. So what, what happens when we build one? It's a matter of scale. Uh, right now, most, most of the cryptography we use um, in the blockchain context is, is quantum vulnerable. Um, we have many um, uh, components we can swap out. Um, the like you 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 take some 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 cryptographic scheme that's that that would be broken and you can replace it with one that wouldn't, um, and the same would be true for for KCG setups. Um, unfortunately, the like all these really nice properties I was that I alluded to earlier those those fall away. Um, that like we don't have any post quantum solutions that allow us to like really easily prove these inside of snarks or etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but I guess an additional problem is that most snarks, well, snarks will break as well because they also rely on these arithmetic assumptions. So like there are like many cascading levels of problems, and then ultimately we would have to like switch to a uh, a hash based system to 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 provide these commitments. Um, so like there are um, mechanisms we could we, we we could put in place, but they would be very ugly. Um, and uh, yeah, poss po possible, but uh, hopefully we still have a few years before we reach that point. <laughs> yeah, I I I think it's it's still like twenty years in the future or so. But I mean, it's always good to kind of think about these things ahead, right? So how soon? So I mean, KZG is only um, a part of four eight four four. So there's different things that also have to go into it. So I assume it's a prerequisite. But as soon as it's done, four eight four four might not be done. So. Um, how how long after the ceremony is over do you think 4844 will be live? Oh, I had unmuted to answer the question, but actually I don't I don't know if I can answer that specifically. I rough rough deadline possibly or like a what people expect. Um so let's see. So we're hoping to start very soon. Um as you said it's a prerequisite, uh but it'll be done <laughs> Let's just say I'm, I'm pretty confident that it'll be done to our satisfaction before 4844 is ready. Um, hopefully sometime mid-year. Maybe that's, is that general enough or specific enough? Uh, that's, that's probably as, as specific as I would guess. Roughly around that time. The, like, it, it basically comes down to uh, the, how much time devs have to work on implementing 4844. Um, so like, where are we in all of this testing? Uh, there are withdrawals, the with withdrawal fork, which is which is going to be shipped beforehand. Um, and that's that's the, 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 the next upgrade. Um, and then after that uh, will be 4844. And the question, like, the, the we, it, it's very hard to answer exactly when that will be. But as Trent said, something like the middle of this year, I think, is a, a, a reasonable answer. Um, and then the idea is to have the ceremony uh, done. Uh, we've mentioned this this two month time frame, which is where we have like lots of contributions. Um, and like the idea there is that's long enough for everyone to to participate, and it's about as reasonably short as we could expect people to uh, like uh, the, the expect four eight four four to ship in some like magic world where somehow we have infinite dev power and whatever. It would I think look something like that. Uh, realistically. I'll, that, that that's not what, what the world looks like, but we want to be prepared for that in case. Um, after those two months, we'll have the general contribution period where we'd like have all these fun, weird, wacky contributions. Special, special contribution. Special, sorry, special, special contribution. We have all these wa weird, wacky contributions. And then after that, uh, we will just go back to allowing normal contributions again um, until 4844 is ready to ship because this is like the kind of thing where we can say, okay, cool, like 4844 is ready to ship in a month. So there's like, in a week's time, we'll shut down the ceremony kind of thing. These are all rough timelines, by the way. But like something like that, you're like, say, okay, cool. We like now 4844 is ready, so we can uh, shut down the ceremony. Um, and ultimately, like the ceremony can run as long as 4844 is in progress um, to try to have as many people America. participate as possible. Yeah, exactly. So um, how can people learn about all of this? So basically, if people want to build a client for the ceremony or just participate in the ceremony or you know, be a special contributor and video themselves, wh wh where do they go to find out about all of this? Easiest place to start is probably ceremony.ethereum.org. That'll be sort of the, the home base for 
a lot of different bits of information, and then the hosted interface can also be gotten through there. Um, we'll also have some IPFS versions, but yeah, that's that's where I would direct people if they're interested in writing an implementation. There are some links out from there. Uh, you can also go directly to the Ethereum org blog that has the, the post and the explanation of what sort of contributions or what sort of um, grant applications we're looking for, whether you're writing your own implementation or doing a special contribution. Yeah. Cool. And what's what's next for the two of you once uh, this has all, you know, gone smoothly and 4844 is deployed? I don't actually have a reasonable answer to that. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, this has been fulfilling so much of my time, just like trying to f like ensure that this this runs really smoothly and uh, that that um, this is this is all secure. Um, that uh, I don't know what my next project is. I kind of specialize in doing these um, research projects, which are very much related to the core protocol um, of Ethereum, but also a little bit adjacent. Um, and so I will probably see what the next the next. Uh, Uh, project is along alongside Ethereum that needs to be done. For me, it's probably um, I mean, there's there's always the the general coordination work of getting people stakeholders engaged in network upgrades and uh, helping people understand how the network is evolving or where where it should go. So that that work is like always ongoing. So I'll probably just keep doing that. Um, but another major project is uh, Protocol Guild, which is a collective of individuals who are. Uh, working to fund the core protocol um, outside of traditional funding sources. Um, that's a, probably what I'll, I'll start to focus on once this is done, or at least, you know, kicked off. That sounds super interesting. Uh, where can I find out more about uh, the Protocol Guild? The Twitter handle is Protocol Guild, so that's probably a good place to start. There's some links you can dive into, um, and then I could probably just, I'll message you some stuff after this. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you both for coming on. Uh, I look forward to participating in the real ceremony. Uh, and let's see whether I can find, you know, a special enough way to kind of uh, get through the grants process. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, we, we would love to have you apply and maybe do something fun. Um, thank you for hosting us. I really appreciate it uh, that we get to share this project we've been working on for so long since like mid last year. And um, Finally, it's, it's, it's almost ready. By the time this comes out, I don't know what your editing turnaround is, but the ceremony will probably be live. Oh, it'll be out this week. Oh, okay, maybe not. <laughs> Depending <laughs> on what part of the week, but um, it'll be very close. Uh, either way, um, this is great for just getting the word out there and, and um, letting us share sort of the frame framing of the ceremony and sort of the stuff that went into it. So thank you again. I appreciate you having us.